This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Swiss Family Robinson by Johann David Wyss Chapter 22 I projected an excursion with my eldest son to explore the limits of our country and satisfy ourselves that it was an island and not a part of a continent. We set out ostensibly to bring the sledge we had left the previous evening. I took Turk and the ass with us, and left Flora with my wife and children, and with a bag of provisions we left Falcon's Nest as soon as the breakfast was over. In crossing a wood of oaks covered with the sweet eatable acorn, we again met with the sow. Our service to her in the evening did not seem to be forgotten for she appeared tamer and did not run from us. A little farther on we saw some beautiful birds. Fritz shot some, among which I recognized the large blue Virginian jay, and some different kinds of parrots. As he was reloading his gun, we heard at a distance a singular noise, like a muffled drum, mingled with the sound made in sharpening a saw. It might be savages, and we plunged into a thicket, and there discovered the cause of the noise in a brilliant green bird, seated on the withered trunk of a tree. It spread its wings and tail, and strutted about with strange contortions, to the great delight of its mates, who seemed lost in admiration of him. At the same time he made the sharp cry we heard, and, striking his wing against the tree, produced the drum-like sound. I knew this to be the ruffed grouse, one of the greatest ornaments of the forests of America. My insatiable hunter soon put an end to the scene. He fired at the bird, who fell dead, and his crowd of admirers with piercing cries took to flight. I reprimanded my son for so rashly killing everything we met with without consideration, and for the mere love of destruction. He seemed sensible of his error, and as the thing was done, I thought it as well to make the best of it, and sent him to pick up his game. "'What a creature!' said he, as he brought it. "'How it would have figured in our poultry-yard, if I had not been in such a hurry!' We went on to our sledge in the gourdwood, and as the morning was not far advanced, we determined to leave all here, and proceed in our projected excursion beyond the chain of rocks. But we took the ass with us to carry our provisions, and any game or other object we should meet with in the new country we hoped to penetrate. Amongst gigantic trees, and through grass of a prodigious height, we travelled with some labour, looking right and left to avoid danger, or to make discoveries. Turk walked the first, smelling the air. Then came the donkey, with his grave and careless step. And we followed, with our guns in readiness. We met with plains of potatoes and of manioc, amongst the stalks of which were sporting tribes of agoutis, but we were not tempted by such game. We now met with a new kind of bush, covered with small white berries about the size of a pea. On pressing these berries, which adhered to my fingers, I discovered that this plant was the Myrica serifera, or candleberry myrtle, from which a wax is obtained that may be made into candles. With great pleasure I gathered a bag of these berries, knowing how my wife would appreciate this acquisition, for she often lamented that we were compelled to go to bed with the birds as soon as the sun set. We forgot our fatigue as we proceeded, in contemplation of the wonders of nature, flowers of marvellous beauty, butterflies of more dazzling colours than the flowers, and birds graceful in form and brilliant in plumage. Fritz climbed a tree, and succeeded in securing a young green parrot, which he enveloped in his handkerchief, with the intention of bringing it up and teaching it to speak. And now we met with another wonder, a number of birds who lived in a community, in nests, sheltered by a common roof, in the formation of which they had probably laboured jointly. This roof was composed of straw and dry sticks, plastered with clay, 
which rendered it equally impenetrable to sun or rain. Pressed as we were for time, I could not help stopping to admire this feathered colony. This leading us to speak of natural history, as it relates to animals who live in societies, we recalled in succession the ingenious labours of the beavers and the marmots, the not less marvellous constructions of the bees, the wasps, and the ants, and I mentioned particularly those immense ant hills of America, of which the masonry is finished with such skill and solidity that they are sometimes used for ovens, to which they bear a resemblance. We had now reached some trees quite unknown to us. They were from forty to sixty feet in height, and from the bark, which was cracked in many places, issued small balls of a thick gum. Fritz got one off with difficulty, it was so hardened by the sun. He wished to soften it with his hands, but found that heat only gave it the power of extension, and that by pulling the two extremities, and then releasing them, it immediately resumed its first form. Fritz ran to me, crying out, "'I have found some India-rubber!' "'If that be true,' said I, "'you have made a most valuable discovery.' He thought I was laughing at him, for we had no drawing to rub out here. I told him this gum might be turned to many useful purposes. Among the rest we might make excellent shoes of it. This interested him. How could we accomplish this? "'The Kuchuk said I is the milky sap which is obtained from certain trees of the euphorbium kind, by incisions made in the bark. It is collected in vessels, care being taken to agitate them, that the liquid may not coagulate. In this state they cover little clay bottles with successive layers of it, till it attains the required thickness. It is then dried in smoke, which gives it the dark brown color. Before it is quite dry, it is ornamented by lines and flowers drawn with the knife. Finally, they break the clay form, and extract it from the mouth, and there remains the india-rubber bottle of commerce, soft and flexible. Now this is my plan for shoemaking. We will fill a stocking with sand, cover it with repeated layers of the gum till it is of the proper thickness, then empty out the sand, and if I do not deceive myself, we shall have perfect boots or shoes. Comfortable in the hope of new boots, we advanced through an interminable forest of various trees. The monkeys on the coconut trees furnished us with pleasant refreshment, and a small store of nuts besides. Among these trees I saw some lower bushes, whose leaves were covered with a white dust. I opened the trunk of one of these, which had been torn up by the wind, and found in the interior a white farinaceous substance, which, on tasting, I knew to be the sago imported into Europe. This, as connected with our subsistence, was a most important affair, and my son and I, with our hatchets, laid open the tree, and obtained from it twenty-five pounds of the valuable sago. This occupied us an hour, and, weary and hungry, I thought it prudent not to push our discoveries farther this day. We therefore returned to the gourd wood, placed all our treasures on the sledge, and took our way home. We arrived without more adventures, and were warmly greeted, and our various offerings gratefully welcomed, especially the green parrot. We talked of the kuchuk and new boots with great delight during supper, and afterwards my wife looked with exceeding content at her bag of candle-berries, anticipating the time when we should not have to go to bed, as we did now, as soon as the sun set. End of chapter